Hey guys, it's Patrick Lusky. I've had a ton of interest come through the 8th Hour site asking for a brew day video in response to uh, some of the build videos you've seen. Uh, so today we're going to go ahead and do a wit. Uh, we're going to send 10 gallons to the unitank and then I plan on splitting that up after fermentation. Uh, we'll do five straight away to a keg and then we're going to do five uh, that we're going to age on top of a fruit puree and then we'll keg that at a later date. Now a few things we've done in advance here prepping for brew day. Uh, we did a yeast starter uh, about three days ago, which I'll walk you through here in the video. As well as yesterday, we went ahead and filled the hot liquor tank behind me, the mash tun, and sanitized the unit tank. It just simplifies today and shortens the time required to complete the brew day. Um, and now, as you guys can tell, huge fan of brewing, obviously. Um, not a huge fan of video editing. So bear with me. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm going to do a quick yeast starter. Um, I know some guys are Paris and do a... a a simple war or uh, build up the worst or the yeast starter with DME or LME. I'm a huge fan of these uh, fast pitches. Uh, a few bucks extra to save me uh, quite a bit of time is well worth it in my book. Um, real simple. I've cleaned the Erlenmeyer flask with PBE and I've uh, sanitized it with Star Sands. She's ready to go. Uh, top of the can's been sanitized. Uh, so I'm just going to pour this in here. Uh, and I've calculated we have two. Uh, we have two Y-Yeast packs uh, for this 10 gallon batch. Uh, we're using 3944. I calculated that we needed uh, just a one liter uh, yeast starter here. So uh, real simple instructions on the back of the can, but basically for one liter, uh, you need one can of the fast pitch and then another 16 ounces of water. I know some guys are gonna have a heart attack. But I just use tap water here to fill the can back up 10 years. I've never had an issue with that. So we're going to add the water back to the Erlenmeyer flask. And then besides the fast pitch and the water, I usually add just a few uh, granules of the yeast nutrients. Uh, there's a little bit built into the fast pitch, but I've had it for so long sitting around, so I figured I might as well just keep using it. Uh, so a little bit of yeast nutrients. And then I sanitize my scissors. Uh, the Y yeast pack here, take the corner off. We smacked it about, well, about two hours ago, so she didn't have much time to build up. You could certainly use just one pack and you could have done a, a step up with the with the yeast starter, but again, I'm a little crunched for time and I just wanted to make sure I had enough yeast, a cell count here for my yeast strain. All right guys, uh, sanitized my foil here. And then we're just gonna throw that in the stir plate and let her go. Hey, uh, I do a few things a day before just to make brew day seem a little quicker. Uh, first thing I'm doing is we're filling up the uh, 14 gallon unit tank with star sand. Uh, and then later here in the day, I'm gonna fill uh, the hot liquor tank and the mash tun to get ready for tomorrow. Uh, 14 gallon unit tank for tomorrow, uh, cause we're just, we're doing a 10 gallon batch. It just made sense. Uh, a few things I do, uh, garden hose, Tucked under the sink. I actually filled a garden hose uh, with uh, two ounces of star sand here, and then I connect it to the tri clamp, uh, and then just fill up the unit tank from there. Um, everything on the setups again is plumbed uh, to not ruin the floor. So I have uh, the blow off currently hooked to my drain manifold. You can see right here, going down into one of the ports. Anything that connects into this guy for brew day is going to be going uh, down. We have a floor drain. Uh, back behind uh, the brewery setup. So I'm just waiting for the unit tank to fill up. And uh, once we see it coming out here out of the blow off tube, I will cut the water off to that and then we'll let that sit till brew day tomorrow. Okay, so we've just finished up filling up the unit tank uh, with star sand. We've disconnected the hose. Uh, I'm sure I'll get questions on it. So 
I have a garden hose uh, with a tri-clamp fitting on the end. Works out real slick, hooks up to all my tanks. Then I have a tri-clamp on the end of the, uh, the uh, sprayer itself. Uh, it makes for an easy day of cleaning. And then underneath here, I just have a, a valve I made up here. So I have hot water on the top, uh, which is soft for cleaning. And then I have hard water for cold because we end up using the house water for uh, filling up the brew kettles for brew day. It's all independent of the actual sink up here. So we just finished sanitizing the unit tank. Uh, moving on to filling the kettles. I have the hose hooked up, uh, it's the filter system. And right now, looking at Beersmith, we need just under seven and a half gallons for this batch uh, in the mash ton. And then using brewing water, uh, we're using, it's a 10 gallon batch. So I always fill the uh, tank up to nine gallons for the sparge water. Uh, with the Herms coil up there, it uh, displaces about a half a gallon. So we'll fill it to the nine and a half mark. I won't need all that water, but it's better to have it up there than not. And then it's also treated uh, for uh, the brew day as well. So I already have the hose going right now. Uh, it's going through the filter system. And then these are my drain lines that I use for uh, the tanks. But right now I'm filling through this. It's going up to my hot liquor tank currently. Uh, it comes up and around and then ends up dumping up in here. This is my clean pump on top. Um, right now I'm filling both from uh, the inlet and the outlet way in the back. And uh, what's really nice about this is it actually primes my pump so we don't have to do that for brew day. Uh, you can see we just got about a quarter of a tank filled here. And while this is going, I'm gonna go ahead and pour in the distilled water we've calculated. Uh, it's a pretty light batch. So we're gonna use a 40% we're gonna just use 40% distilled water for this brew day. I need uh, 3.6 gallons in the hot liquor tank and uh, 2.96, we'll call it three, in the mash tun. Nine and a half gallons. I'm gonna go ahead and close both valves here. So it's gonna stop filling to the top tank. And then what I did down here, all I do is open this valve and now it's going to fill up both to my mash tun up here uh, through this bottom pump and also in the back it's going to start filling up towards into my Herms coil up top. I'll also end up priming this pump when we're done. So I already have the three gallons of distilled in here so now we're just going to wait for this to fill up if I want to watch it, I'm going to go ahead and close the mash tun because it fills this first since it's lower than the Herms coil. So I'm going to go ahead and close this valve now. And in a few seconds, we should start seeing how the water flowing out of my inlet from my mash tun. So now we're just looking for seven and a half gallons in the mash tun. So I'm at seven and a half gallons now in the mash tun. I'm going to kill the water. I'm going to go close all my valves so my Herms coil doesn't start to drain down here. I'm gonna go ahead and shut my feeder valve up top here, if you guys can see it. That's what's hooked. That's where the water's coming in from the filter. All right, so I'm gonna close that. I'll end up disconnecting this. I won't make you guys watch that. And then I'm just gonna get ready for the brew day. So initially, we're gonna close this valve up here, because this is what controls the water from the water from the hot liquor tank either flowing with this valve down, it flows through the Herms coil and into the mash tun. And with it up, back here, I don't have a, a valve on it because I control it up on the hot liquor tank, but that's the return for the hot liquor tank uh, to keep the temperature stable. I see. All right, so I have everything set up for the brew day. The filter is draining on my drip tray for my taps. I have the filler hose that you were watching coming off the filter is now plugged back into the drain manifold. That's how we're gonna clean the setup at the end of the brew day. Those go, those tie into both of my bleeder lines over here on the pumps. And then I put the hose away uh, just to get it out of the way for brew day. I'm going to end up using it again for the chiller plate when we get to that process. And then the only thing I have left to do um, before we're gonna brew beer is I'm gonna drain the star sand now out of the unit tank. Um, all I do is I have a hose here that we're gonna fill or transfer the wort 
uh, from the brew setup to the fermenter. And when I drain uh, the unitank, I'm gonna disconnect this T and move it over here to the drain manifold. And that way I'll sanitize this line as the unitanks drain in, as well as the T, uh, the sanit sanitary valve. And then everything else here gets sanitized. I've cleaned it thoroughly with PBW. And then we actually just did have our six month annual cleaning, which I pacify, uh, pacified everything with uh, some strong acid. So it is thoroughly sanitized right now, but on a normal brew day, I'll run boiling wort through it while we're in the boil kettle uh, to sanitize the plate chiller. Never had an issue with it. Um, and then again, yeah, we'll transfer to the unit tank and uh, we'll show you that in a little bit. Okay, so brew day. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna start off doing is preheating the water. Uh, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna come down here, a little child proofing going on. It's in your living room. Turn on the main power of the panel and then uh, you guys can watch the uh, instructional video on how I built this if you want to know how the panel works in detail um, but right now I'm just gonna fire the hot liquor tank it's targeting 178 um, that probe is in the top here in the return and initially when I'm preheating this I'm not gonna even turn that on I'm gonna just look at the analog gauge here I'm shooting for about 180 190 and then that way I don't have to listen to the pumps run either all right so down here on the controller um, controlling which PID is firing. So I'm gonna go over to the hot liquor tank and uh, then I'm gonna go into manual here. And now since it's looking for 178 and it really won't see it, it's gonna have to get pretty hot to read that outside of the kettle. Um, it's firing. I do have a burnt bulb here, which is unfortunate. This is normally lit uh, and shows you when the, when the actual coil is firing. All this down here tells you is that uh, it has the ability to fire if it needs it. Uh, but I can tell you right now the PID is commanding and out input so it's getting hot and we'll keep an eye on it uh, meanwhile we're going to uh, zest some oranges and grapefruits for this uh, wit and i'll also mill the grain hey guys first off we'll talk about the recipe real quick uh pretty standard wit uh, i've tweaked it a little bit i've added some golden naked oats i find it adds a real subtle nut flavor um, just gives it a little bit of depth and then um yeah, real straightforward. The hops are pretty standard, no crazy measurements. And um, I did flinch on the coriander. Uh, we were supposed to put in uh, two ounces, and, and you normally I do one ounce for the five gallon batch, but I, I scaled it back to 1.75 ounces. I just wanted to see how the flavor comes through first before I go crazy. Um, you see down at the bottom, real standard, um, not gonna be huge alcohol. Uh, high percentage beer, we're gonna probably finish around 5.2, 5.3. And then the bitterness is pretty average for a wit. Uh, color's good. Uh, for the mash, uh, I settled in at uh, 152. You guys will see how that plays out with the Herms setup. It's pretty slick, we're gonna target the temperature and uh, really because of the thermal mass, there's no uh, temp drop when you add the grains. So we're gonna hit 152, let it stabilize, and we'll add the grains for the mash in. All right, so that's the basic um, beer smith recipe. And then we'll go down and uh, we do do water adjustments, which I'll cover in a little bit. We're doing a yellow balanced uh, beer here and I got the water adjustment. Uh, we've targeted our profile. You'll see in the video, uh, me adding my salts. I've had my water test at Ward Labs and uh, we're gonna dilute this here with 40% to distill water. We have pretty hard water here in Minnesota, at least in the suburbs. Um, makes great dark beer, not good for a wit. And then uh, the adjustment summary here, again, I'll go into more detail with this as we get towards uh, the actual brew day. Totals, uh, seven point four gallons in the mash and uh, nine gallons of sparge water. I, uh, I vary my sparge water between batch sizes, five gallons or 10 gallons. I'm really limited. Uh, I can do up to a 15 gallon batch, um, but I do have to replenish the water in the hot liquor tank, uh, partially uh, through the sparge. We're doing fly sparging. Uh, but today we're doing a 10 gallon batch. We'll go up to nine and a half gallons. We don't need all that, but I, uh, I just don't like to run out and cut it that close. So there's no point. Okay, so we've uh, crushed the coriander. I zested a grapefruit, a lemon, a navel orange, and a Valencia orange, as well as uh, we're gonna throw in some dry, dry orange, bittering orange peels as we get towards the end of the brew day. 
right now I'm moving on to water chemistry. I use Bruin water. I've had my water tested a few times at Ward Labs. They do a nice job. Uh, what we're set up for today, we're doing the wit. So we're, I'm just doing a real easy profile, yellow balanced. Um, you can see what my existing profile is here in yellow and what I'm targeting up top. Uh, down below here in the green, you can see with my additions, I've got it as close as possible. I'm gonna use a little bit of gypsum, some canning salt, and uh, some calcium chloride to bring my water pro profile up. Remember earlier we used 40% distilled water, so that's into the software. And then we're gonna use phosphoric acid. We have really hard water here uh, in the suburbs in Minnesota, uh, so I have to use phosphoric acid to bring it down. Again, my mash volumes, my sparge volumes, uh, we talked about, we filled the kettles. And then I'm just gonna go to the adjustment summary, guys. Um, real easy, you can see I'm in the green band for pH. Uh, we've talked about the dilution. Uh, with the distilled water and then my totals uh, that I'm going to add here for uh, my minerals and that's all right here uh, canning salt uh, calcium chloride gypsum phosphoric acid phosphoric acid I find this real nice I got this at northern uh, just graduated cylinder to measure to measure the liquids and otherwise the the postal stamp scale uh, for uh, for the canning salt and the calcium chloride the one thing I've already done, I grabbed some water out of the mash tun with the Pyrex here. I find it's, I get a better distribution of the, of the, of the water, uh, the salts uh, in the mash tun as well as the hot liquor tank if I stir it up in the Pyrex first, then add it back uh, to the kettles versus just dumping it all in there. I find sometimes it's sitting at the bottom at the end of the brew day, which defeats the purpose. So I'm gonna measure these out. I'm not gonna make you watch that. And then we'll move on to milling the grains. All right, now it's time to mill the grains. Uh, normally I do this right off my deck here, uh, but unfortunately uh, Minnesota in February, so we're gonna go down to the basement. All right, we're down to the basement. Uh, I'm gonna mill the grain. Uh, luckily the wife's at work, so we're gonna get away with this without getting in trouble. So I just wired this drill up to a switch. Um, I have it zip tied on, although I'm still probably gonna ride the trigger a little bit. Walking underneath the hopper right now. Luckily for me on this on this brew day, it's really it's a 10 gallon batch, but half of it's flaked wheat, so it's really not all that much to mill. So I'm just gonna fill the hopper up. Do this one time here. As you can see, I have a pretty fine crush. I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna use a lot of uh, rice salts here for this anyway, with this being a wheat beer, but um, yeah, just a barley crusher with a cheap drill uh, from Harbor Freight. It's time to empty the unit tank. I've moved the tea uh, from the plate chiller over to my drain manifold. And then I have a container here. I'm gonna pull some star sand from the top butterfly valve on the unit tank. And I'm also going to run some star sand through the sampling valve. As you guys can see, I've seen some questions asked. Um, with this unit tank full under zero pressure, it will push star sand through uh, the coil here. All right, so with that done, I'm going to open the bottom valve. I've disconnected the blow-off tube from the drain manifold. Um, I don't clean out the drain manifold, so I don't, I don't want it to anything air uh, to be pushed back through the blow-off valve as we're draining this. So I'm going to go open up my drain manifold here, and then open this valve, and that's it. We'll reuse the star sand that we collected from the butterfly valve uh, to fill my container down there for when we're actually fermenting. And then once this unit tank's done draining, all I'm gonna do is move this tea back over to the plate chiller and uh, we're ready to brew. All right guys, uh, now that we've got a lot of our stuff organized, all of our adjuncts are measured out, uh, the grain is milled, 
and uh, the unit tank's been drained. We're actually gonna start brew day. And I'll be honest with you, a little bit of movie magic. It took about 25 minutes to heat up. I didn't wanna listen to the pumps run for a ton of time. So I've already preheated the, the mash ton a uh, little bit here, but I'll show you guys how this works. So initially I turned on the hot liquor tank and let it come up to about 180. And then I turned on the pumps uh, to let the temperature between the two kettles stabilize. So we're, about, we're right at about temp now. I'm just gonna go through the process. Uh, I'm gonna open my valve from a mash ton. And then I'm gonna come down. I have my water pump for the hot liquor tank and then the pump for the mash ton, which ends up being for the whirlpool for the boil kettle as well. You're gonna see the water start to come back down through the Herms coil. It's my viewing port there. And that'll start to catch up here in a second. And then uh, you guys probably can't see it too well, but you'll see a few fine bubbles running through uh, my sight glass for the hot liquor tank. And right now what's happening is I've switched over to the PID for the mash ton. Uh, mash ton. So I'm targeting 152, it's currently at 149. That's gonna come up pretty quick. Hot liquor tank's about 154. Uh, while we're brewing, you guys will see generally about a two to three degree split between tanks. Uh, and this won't take much time at all to settle out because I'm currently sitting realistically about 150 in the mash ton. Now when this does come up to temperature, it's measuring the temperature back here as it comes through this three-way valve. And it'll hit 152 about five minutes up early on the mash uh, readout here on the, on the PID. So once you actually hit temperature on the setup, I do have to let it run for about five minutes so I get an actual temperature inside the entire ton at 152. Now I'm gonna let this run for just a few more minutes to actually stabilize and then we'll add the grain and mash in. And you guys will see, I'll show you, it's pretty impressive. There's no, there's no temperature dip as we're mashing in here. All right, now we've uh, hit our mash temp 152. You're looking at the mash tent here. I'm gonna add the rice holes first. Now notice I have the manifold just connected right now. Uh, one thing I've noticed with that SS manifold, I like it, uh, but if you mash in with it hooked up, you're gonna end up with a stuck manifold and it's pretty hard. You're gonna need like a coat hanger or something to fish out the little holes. So I'll uh, leave it off and I, I do leave it off for a few minutes after we've mashed in to make sure that my Herms coil clears out and then we'll reconnect. Uh, so the first thing to go in, guys, if you looked at the recipe, it's 50% it's wheat, uh, flint wheat, so I'm going to add about a pound of rice hulls, probably get away with about a half pound, but I've had a stuck sparge in the system, it's very rare, but it's, it's not fun when it happens. Uh, so the rice hulls are in, now I'm going to start with the, uh, with the grain. Alright guys, it's pretty thick, but uh, pump's running real well still. I'm not seeing any dough balls. You just kind of pin up the uh, grain against the side of the kettle. You can get a real good look on whether or not it's starting to clump. I'm pretty happy with that. I notice my efficiency will go way down, obviously, if you don't get rid of all the dough balls, but uh, this looks real good right now. Set this aside. So I'm going to let that run for about three minutes here just to make sure all the grain that I've stirred up gets cleared out of the coil and then I'll add the, uh, add the manifold. Uh, one thing I promise guys, uh, as you can see, lid off, going in, temperature didn't budge. It's hitting 152 right now, it's targeting 152. The hot liquor tank's maintaining 154 right now. Uh, to hold the mash ton at the appropriate temperature. All right, it's been three minutes since we mashed in. I have a timer running for 57 minutes. Uh, you can see temperature still spot on the mash, 152. Um, and then I've already gone ahead and hooked up the manifold. It rests right on top of the bottom, right on top of the grain bed here. But it's really nice having the silicone hose because it just adjusts itself uh, to the proper depth depending on how much uh, beer we're brewing at any given time. You can see the color is pretty light right now. So it'll get a little more clear here as we continue uh, through the brew process. So 60 minutes total on the mash uh, is what I generally run. And then I transfer over to the 
uh, over to the boil kettle at about over about the course of 30 minutes. I don't like to go under 30 minutes. That's where my efficiency will start to drop off. But I've noticed I don't need the whole hour uh, to transfer over. I get a pretty good extraction. 10 minutes into the mash, I ended up pulling a sample so we could test the pH. Uh, and then I threw it outside to let it cool down for a few minutes. And now we're getting to the point where we're gonna test it with the meter. Um, I have distilled water for rinsing, uh, 0.4 buffer solution for calibration, as well as 0.7. So we've already calibrated the instrument. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a little rinse. And then I'm gonna put it in our sample here. See how we're sitting. To be honest, guys, I expect this to come up to 5.5 uh, .5 on the dots. That's what we're calculating in brewing water, and I have that thing pretty nailed down. I am, I haven't been surprised in over a year at where my pH falls. If we let this sit long enough, that's going to come up to 5.5. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jot that down in uh, in Beer Smith so I can track that. And then again, just to show you guys uh, in brewing water. That's what we were targeting is 5.5 with the mash pH. So that's, that's pretty much right on. And you can see that it has came up to 5.5 now. So you can see we're 30 minutes into the mash. Something I want to show to you guys that don't do a constant recirc. Um, my wart's running super clear right now. If I open the lid, you can see how clear that is. It went from that murky uh, yellowish to a super clear wart. And then you can see how well that uh, manifold works. You get a really nice distribution on top of the grain bed. It sits right on top of the grain bed. And again, as long as you use a flexible hose to make the connection, it's, um, it's self-adjusting per, per your batch size. Uh, so I'm bored waiting for the mash to finish up. I'll talk about the yeast here. I brewed it two days prior, uh, planning on pitching the whole starter. Uh, if it's under two liters, I generally just pitch the little starter. If it's a little bigger than that, I'll chill it overnight and uh, and then just pitch the yeast slurry at the bottom here. This is what you're wanting uh, to pitch into the fermenter. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and decant, I don't know, probably 600, 800 milliliters off of this and then put it back on the stir plate and let it spin for a little while here. Uh, I pulled it out this morning out of the fridge, so it's definitely up to room temperature, let it wake up a little bit. Uh, and get ready to go into the fermenter. So we have 10 minutes left in the mash. I'm gonna go ahead and drive the temperature up to 168. Now this isn't a perfect science, uh, but it's all about the process staying consistent. So I'm gonna target 158. It's gonna start heating up the hot liquor tank to achieve that temperature. Got 10 minutes left. Uh, it won't quite be there, it'll probably be at 162. Uh, when the timer goes off, we'll let it finish driving up the rest of the way, and then we'll start to uh, collect our wort over into the boil kettle. All right, so the timer went off about five minutes ago. Uh, it took that extra time to come up to 168, uh, which is what I expect on the system. Uh, we've equalized in the ton as well on the PID. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the controller over to the hot liquor tank. Right now it's looking at the back of the mash ton. Switch over the hot liquor tank. Now I have it set to drive to 175 for my sparge water. All right, so it's no longer caring about the mash. And then what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna kill the pump for the mash recirculation right now. So I'm gonna reconfigure that. I'm gonna come up and lock all valve up here for the Herms coil. And then I'm gonna come down here and reconfigure some valves. So we're getting ready to transfer to the boil kettle. I have everything shut up here, so nothing's gonna move. So I'm coming down here. I have the three-way valve set up to still draw from the mash tun. Coming through the pump, leader valve we don't use during the actual brew day. And then back here, it's hard to see. I have another three-way valve. I've had to bend this handle up just for, for space. Something I wanna rework because this pump's eventually here. They start to die. So what I'm gonna do here, is turn the valve. So now it's gonna direct that mash ton. It's locked down. It's gonna take the mash right here. It's 
going to run it through the pump, come around through the chiller plate. Now I have built a bypass on this. So I have it in the bypass position, so it's going to come through this tube here. And, you know, some of it will drain into the plate chiller, but my whole purpose is to not run the entire mash tun through the chiller plates. It's going to come out here to the T, and then we're going to come up, and it's going to come out this top valve here. So now we waited for our hot liquor tank to come up to 175 and stabilize. Uh, mash tun's still at 168. The reading on the PID controller from the back of the tank is just cooled off. Uh, so now we're going to configure for sparch. Come out and remove the lid here. Let's sink. All right. I have a sparge arm on the back of the ton. We're going to lift up into position. Set it just on top of the hose here for now. All right. And then what we're going to do is come down below. Our pump is off. So we shouldn't see uh, much movement here for the sparge. So I'm gonna open that up. All right, so now the water is able to flow from the hot liquor tank. And now the throughway valve blocks it from coming down. So it's gonna come up through the Herms coil, which is nice, because it's gonna rinse that. And then into the mash tun. One thing I gotta do before I do that is close the return for the hot liquor tank. So we're gonna kill that. And now uh, we're gonna start transferring some more. Now that our valves are configured, I've turned off the element for the hot liquor tank. I'm gonna switch to boil. It's the boil kettle. It's not gonna fire even though it's commanding it because the switch is off. My valves are in the proper position. So I'm gonna turn on the sparge first. All right, so now it's, I'm gonna open up the valve here. And before I do that, three-way valve back here needs to open. Diverting the water from my manifold to the sparge arm. And if I open this up, start at a little high of a flow right here just to get some extra water. It's pretty thin mash today. And then now that I have the sparge running, okay, that's at 175, and we'll start to be able to get a good reading through the mash tank too, because it, it goes past that uh, sensor as well. And now I'm gonna turn on the work pump. And you can see down here, my sight valve, as soon as I start to crack this butterfly valve up here, we're going to get start to get more transfer. We're just going to get a set of good flow rate. to be good. We're going to time this here and see how many gallons per minute we're pulling here. I want to shoot for a half an hour transfer and I'm going to set the timer on the panel. All right, so now it's still waiting, 30 minutes. All right guys, as we're transferring the ward over to the boil kettle, a few things I want to show you. Uh, I love the sparge arm from SS, works real slick. Um, I get a nice constant uh, flow. And something else that's very beneficial from constant recirculation, you guys can see how clear that wart is. Um, there's very little particulate that gets transferred over from uh, the mash tun. I have a sight glass down here so I can see flow coming across the chiller plate. We use that mainly uh, after the whirlpool process to make sure we're not gonna transfer any hot matter over into the fermenter or through the chiller plate. And then something else I wanted to show you, the reason I target 175 in the hot liquor tank, which the heater element's been turned off, so that will cool down over time. But as I sparge, it hits a, exactly hits a 170 um, for the for me, most of the, of the sparge uh, when we're collecting the runnings into the boil kettle. So that's how I, I shoot for 175 over here, but by the time it hits the mash tun, 170, real good temperature. Just about uh, just under 10 minutes into the transfer here. I'm sitting uh, just coming above three gallons, getting a really nice colored wort. And then again, guys, I'm just using math and throttling it with this top butterfly valve here. And once I, I really maybe move it once or twice here when it starts, and then it's right on. We're transferring just under a half a gallon a minute, uh, which will put me right at a half an hour for the total transfer. We're looking for 13. Uh, 0.85 gallons, we're going to boil down to 12.5. Just about 10 minutes remaining on that 30 minute timer. 
I just ran out of sparge water. You can see the sight glass is empty. I have about an inch of water on top of the grain bed. We're sitting right at about eight gallons in the boil kettle. Now again, we're gonna target 13.85 uh, gallons. It'll be about perfect. And uh, once we get to about 11.85, about two gallons short, I'll turn the heating coil on and start heating up towards boil. We'll talk a little bit more about that process when we get a little closer. So we're getting close to uh, getting our 13.85 gallons. So I'm gonna come down here to the panel. A couple things, uh, we're set to boil now. All right, so the boil PID is gonna control the system. I'm gonna fire that. Right now it's targeting 212. I'm gonna turn the alarm on. I have the alarm pre-programmed to go off at 210. And what I do, uh, when it goes off at 210, I'll switch over to the manual mode of this PID and then instead of targeting a temperature, I'm going to target a percentage rate of fire. So on this system, about 82% uh, seems to give me a nice, uh, a perfect boil, boil setting. Uh, so it's going to fire 82% of the time. So we've hit our 13.85 gallons. I turned the pump off. We actually ran out of sparge water. Uh, it just stopped in the hose just as we finished up. So right at the right amount of sparge water. Uh, Again, I have the uh, boil uh, PID firing, and now we're gonna move some valves around here to set up for recirculation of the, uh, of the boil kettle. So I'm gonna come down here. All right, this three-way was set, all right, to collect from the uh, mash tun, so I'm gonna select that over to the boil kettle. All right, now we're already set to come through this pump with the three-way valve, three valve in the back, and then we're gonna bypass the chiller plate come through and then back up into the boil kettle. So what I'm gonna do is open up both valves before we get to the boil. All right, there'll, there'll be some air in this one. You'll see that all get drawn in, so that should fill. And then what I'm gonna do is select the lower pump back on. And we may have to prime this again sometimes. That's the case this time. So all I'm gonna do is reach back for the bleeder valve. I'm gonna just a little bit of work just to get rid of that air. And now if we come up, we have a pretty good whirlpool started up here. Second thing I'm gonna do, uh, just to clean the, clear the chiller plate out a little bit because that's been collecting a little bit of wort. So I'm gonna push uh, this valve, three-way valve, up into the chill position. You hear it's a little hard on the pump. You're gonna see some air flowing through some air bubbles coming out. I just want to get fresh wort inside that chiller plate. And we're going to do this a couple times during the boil. Again, to completely sterilize the chiller plate. So that's enough. I'm going to reselect the bypass. So you can hear it's easier on the pump. And then I'm going to deselect the pump. And now we're at 159, coming up to the 212 for the boil. And just a waiting game. Now that we have everything configured for the boil, I'm gonna take a sample, see what our gravity reading is. And I'll let that cool down before I let it hit the hydrometer. And then I... Now that the samples had a little bit of time to cool, I'm gonna go ahead and see where we're at for our pre-boil gravity. As you can see, we're right on our gravity. Uh, pardon my shaking here. It's uh, 1.04546. If you come into Beersmith for our planned estimated pre-boil gravity, we are 1.046. Again, with a system like this, we have the software pretty dialed in, as well as our uh, our water adjustments dialed in. So it's it's pretty accurate. I do find my gravity my uh, Efficiency drops a little bit when we're brewing these high uh, percentage wheat beers, um, but even that, I have that taken into account, a special profile just for uh, any wheat beer above 30%. So uh, right now, that's looking good. We're just still waiting on the boil kettle to come up to temperature. And then while I'm doing this, uh, while I'm waiting, what we're gonna do is we're gonna clean up the mash tun. I'm not gonna videotape this process. I'll talk you through it a little bit. So again, why the temperature's coming up, what I do is I scoop out 
uh, the grains, I have a big scoop, just throw those in a bucket, take them out to the trash can. And then what I'll do is I'll spray this with that garden hose and shop back it dry. So we got rid of all the actual material. And then once brew day's over, I will shop back the hop uh, matter out of the boil kettle. And then we'll run either PBW or uh, one step through the system I alternate. I find I get a better clean if I use uh, the products every other time. Uh, now I don't normal. I don't always clean the hot liquor tank. It just had water in it. I'll do that about every two to three brew days, depending. But it's it's the same process for cleaning as it is for the brew day. If I was to do the hot liquor tank, I would fill that up with our solution, our cleaning solution, circulate it through the water pump, back up it into itself, let it sit, heat it up. And then I would transfer it back over through the sparge arm and the manifold to clean that out. And then again into the into the mash tun, let it sit for a while, scrub it out, and then transfer that down through the bottom pump, through the chiller plate. And that, that'll get its own bath too here at the end of the brew day. Take that apart and do it in the sink, um, back flush it. But I would transfer this cleaning solution up into the boil kettle and uh, clean that out. And then once that's done again, back through the chiller plate and into the drain manifold. Right. So again, well, once we're hitting it with chemicals, there's no actual hot particulates or grain in the ton. Everything's clean in place and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Again, I'm not going to videotape the cleaning uh, process, but uh, it, it runs just like the brew day. It's pretty quick, about half an hour. Getting close to my target. Going to turn that off. I'm going to switch uh, to manual. You can see the manual light up next to the input there. And then I'm going to go into percentage and dial it down to 82 and let that come up uh, to a nice steady boil. You can see we're getting pretty close. I also have a lot of humidity starting to go into the house. So I'm gonna turn on the fan. Um, this is turning into a fishing story, but I, I believe that fan's about 480 CFM. I set it to low, back to the house, pretty nice. Just outside mounted fan on the side of the house. and we're just gonna wait for this to come up to boil uh, before we add our hops. You guys can also see that while I was waiting for that temperature to come up, I got all the grain emptied and then I hosed down the inside of the kettle. So this kettle's ready to be uh, vacuumed uh, at the same time we end up cleaning out the boil cup. So we've reached our boil here. I'm gonna add the hops. Maybe try not to boil over. Well, that's a new one for me. All right, so hops are added. We're gonna start a 60 minute timer. About 10 minutes in here. Uh, just a nice roll boil. I don't know if you guys have ever, uh, anybody else fear the boil over. Uh, having a boil over on a clean in place setup is a pain in the butt. So I'm glad we got that down. Uh, the boil's under control. And we'll just sit and wait out. Uh, we're gonna do the next hop edition with 15 minutes remaining. In case you guys are wondering how well that fan works, uh, it's currently negative one outside. And uh, I'll give you a peek of that setup. So it's doing a pretty good job removing the moisture. All right, we have 15 minutes left in the boil. Volume's looking pretty good. I'm gonna add, try not to add the whole bag. It's easier when you have two hands. All right, so we're gonna add the, uh, we've added the extra two ounces at the 15 minute mark. So we're right at the end of the boil. I've added all our adjuncts. Uh, again, uh, grapefruit, uh, a couple oranges, and then some bittering dried orange peels, as well as, uh, uh, 1.75 ounces of coriander in my strainer. Now, I don't put my hops in anything, no matter what kind of beer I'm making, um, but with coriander, I do add it to that strainer um, during the whirlpool, because it is not a friend of those chugger pumps. I will stop them. So uh, I'm gonna start the whirlpool now. The heat's coming off. We're gonna do a 20 minute uh, whirlpool. And then uh, the big thing uh, guys complain about, the Whirlpool is not working, especially when they're preventing the chiller plates from clogging up. Turn that on. Um, they don't let it rest. So we'll do a 20 minute Whirlpool. I'm gonna push that strainer down here. And uh, 
And then once 20 minutes is over, I'm gonna pull the adjuncts and we're gonna give it a 10 minute rest so we can get a nice cone build up. And I'll show you guys that in the middle of the boil kettle. Guys, the alarm just went off for the Whirlpool. So I'm gonna get uh, the pump turned off here. Uh, I'm gonna come up and shut the return valve on the kettle. I should have showed you. There was still a lot of stuff floating by here in the sight glass as we were whirlpooling. And that's why you really have to let it rest now for another five, 10 minutes, which in fact, I'm gonna set a timer for her just so I have a ballpark. And that's what's gonna let it, the, all that stuff settle out into a cone. All right, so that's set for 10 minutes. Um, I do have the ability obviously to hold temperature while we're doing the whirlpool for some of our, of our like New England IPs. Um, but not, not obviously terribly important for this beer, so I just let it fall. I have the uh, hose hooked up for the plate chiller now. All right, so I'm gonna run cold water through that. And then I have the drain hooked up in the back. Uh, it's going back to the drain manifold there. I'm gonna switch the bypass. I hit this uh, twice uh, with boiling water, boiling wort to have it settle out. Uh, or sorry, boiling wort to sterilize the inside of that chiller. You guys will see at the end of this video, I clean it out pretty good when we're done brewing. Um, so we're just gonna wait for that 10 minutes to expire. I'm also gonna pull out the adjuncts now, um, but that's definitely gonna be a two-handed process, so you're not gonna get to see that. Um, you're gonna get some background noise from now on out. I got the peanut gallery home from school. Uh, so hope that doesn't drive you guys crazy. All right, we're still waiting for the uh, whirlpool to settle. Um, a little bit ago, before that, I took a sample uh, of the post boil. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at that with a hydrometer. We're supposed to be at 1.53, and we're right on the money with the hydrometer. All right, 1.53, and then our estimated uh, original gravity for this beer is coming in at 1.053. So beer's looking pretty good right now. We're gonna chill it and uh, send it to the fermenter and pitch the yeast. Plate chiller cooled down. Uh, now we're gonna turn our pump on and send it to the fermenter. Fortunate uh, Minnesota winter, groundwater so cold, we can run full tilt out uh, to the fermenter. Uh, one thing we gotta get set up before we do that, I have the oxygen tank in here. I also have CO2 in the back for carbonation and pushing, uh, doing pressure transfers. So I'm gonna open that. We're gonna run pretty fast today, so I'm gonna run about an eighth of a liter of oxygen. So I don't know if you guys will be able to see that. There's an indicator right here. I'm gonna run a one eighth of oxygen to uh, the wart as it runs through. So that oxygen's actually coming out here to this hose. I'm gonna open the valve here. The valve to the fermenter is open. Valve up here, release pressure as we fill the fermenter. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna turn our pump on. I'm not bypassing the plate chiller anymore. So we're gonna open our sample valve and we should see flow. And now as we continue to transfer the wart, uh, I'm just watching my gauge here. I'm gonna try to hold right around 70 going to the fermenter. So I'm just using the sampling valve to meter the flow so that we get the proper temperature when the wort is fully transferred. All right, guys, last part of the brew day. Um, we've transferred all of the wort into the fermenter. We're gonna go ahead and pitch the yeast now. All right, so about 800 milliliters going into the fermenter. Honestly, I normally hold the stir plate at the bottom so I don't lose the stir bar, but I'm brewing one-handed today, so we'll see what happens here. I am gonna sacrifice a little bit of yeast to not lose that. Uh, so that's in the fermenter. I'm also gonna pitch, I have a couple tilts. It's been sanitizing down in the jar here that I'm going to use for my blow-off tube. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that in. Now that ties to this iPad up top. 
We'll get that set up here in a little bit. A couple things here. I have my fer fermenter control, a temperature control down here. We're targeting 70 for this brew. Should be real easy for it to handle. Um, and then also, uh, this is what the boil kettle looks like after the whirlpool. Um, this is honestly why I don't have any issue with the, with the plate chiller is most of the hot matter is left behind and the boil kettle does a real nice job. Works out pretty slick. All right guys, that's it for the brew day. Hope you enjoyed it. Try to update you as the fermentation uh, worked its way out. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and any suggestions, I'd certainly take them. Cheers.